So right now we're going to do a faster little demo just to prove that uh, watercolor doesn't have to be totally overwrought and be part of a mixed media, if you will. So in this case, uh, we're going to even start off with a pen and ink drawing uh, that will then do some, you know, kind of light washy watercolor within. We'll see how committed it gets. So I've got a little drawing here of a, a French impressionist that I did as a drawing exercise um, from like a piece of folded foil somewhere in here. Um, and I'm going to take the reference, put it over to the side, and now uh, attempt a little painting of him. So I've got a Pentel brush pen here. It's uh, essentially a fountain pen with a little watercolor brush tip on it. And I'm working on uh, a very scaled back low value printout of my drawing on a sheet of Reeves BFK printmaking paper. There's a period of time in my life where I thought I would be a very sort of precise, uh, detailed, detail-oriented person. And whereas I'm still fairly detail-oriented, uh, I, at some point, had to admit that I'm not precise. And that if I could just let, you know, whatever anomalies uh, happen in my art, whether it's, you know, the unsteadiness of my hand or uh, the innate character of the material. Uh, and from that standpoint, even using materials that had more innate character to them, that that would actually serve my work better, uh, make it more interesting and to look at and, and in a way sort of easier to do in the meantime too if you're if you're not fighting your physiology because right? the, the world is full of you know people with very steady hands and people with not so steady hands All right so I've got like I said, I've got my little sketch under here, but I also have the original value study sitting in front of me to work from. All right, I'm doing my best to sort of let some shapes mass together as I go. Uh, when using a brush or a brush pen in this case to draw, you just make sure that you don't turn it into a magic marker, all right? Uh, it has things it's going to want to do. Uh, if you contradict them, you can get some interesting effects out of the deal. But, you know, be nice to them. Don't, don't kill them. <laughs> I mean, I feel like that's the bottom of the barrel on being nice to things, but, you know, worth remembering. I think this is Camille Pizarro. I looked at a couple different impressionists after I drew it to see which one I was accidentally channeling. And I thought at first it was going to be Monet, but I think it's Camille Pissarro.
All right, now I'm going to switch over to a, uh, let's see, a Pentel uh, Hybrid Technica pen. Uh, now this is n almost entirely waterproof. Uh, but I like it because it has a very rapidograph like line. Um, and I, I just sort of, I prefer the, uh, the feeling and appearance of the metal on metal point to a, uh, say a micron, uh, felt tip appearance. I'll go finish out some line work, uh, do some hatching where it seems relevant. But, you know, still leave room for, for the watercolor to have a job to do too. All right, so what we're kind of trying to do is, this isn't so much about delivering information while well, that's part of it but what i actually want to choose between media with is what sort of character we want where you know not what is best described with pen but so much as where are the marks of the pen the thing i want to communicate with versus uh the edge and value of the watercolor Now this would be the point in a in-person demo where if I got quiet, started to, I don't know, think, I'd encourage you to just interrupt me and ask some questions. If I happen to be nearby and you have any while you're watching this, you know, by all means. Now, contrary to what you see me doing, my recommendation overall is actually to work slow and deliberately with your line. I tend to always work faster than I should. Uh, and even in attempts to slow down and deliberate, uh, things tend to pick up speed pretty fast. Don't be like me, kids. So now, one thing about uh, waterproof pens, now I said this one is almost waterproof, and what I mean by that is when it dries, it's completely waterproof. But depending on the paper you're working on, it may not dry instantly. Uh, that's, in, that's going to go for a lot of quote-unquote uh, you know, waterproof inks. So what I'm going to do when the inking is done is I'm going to go ahead and uh, blot it with a kneaded eraser, uh, give it a couple seconds with a hair dryer, and we'll see how much that attends to the, uh, the inevitable bleed. All right, which is possibly going to happen too because uh, the Reeves is a pretty absorbent paper. Uh, it's it's 
got a very soft velvety texture to it. Uh, and that may or may not you know, make friends with the ink as it tries to dry. and then we'll be about about ready to get going on the uh, the watercolor portion I also have a theory on again on this embracing of both anomalies of your medium and uh, your own sort of natural kind of jerks and twitches and uh, inadvertent propensities. And that is, uh, you know, so much of the world, you know, and particularly all of the natural world kind of happens by accident. Um, and when we try to control it, when we try to sort of tame it for the sake of a picture, I think that's that's where some of the charm of it goes. If you've ever strangled the life out of something while obeying all the rules of it, while putting everything in place that needed to be in place. I think one of the reasons that we kill things that way is because what makes them look like themselves isn't necessarily the 100% accuracy of the information. It's the fact that it got that way through the accident of, you know, gravity and time. And uh, this goes for wrinkles in clothing and lines and faces and, you know, the wear and tear on furniture. You know, all of these things have forces acting on them that are accidental. You know, sunlight and reflection. And if we allow our marks to embrace that, we can get a little bit more of the feeling of the thing across in a picture. Uh, took me a while to embrace that personally, artistically, and, uh, and some days I still forget. One thing it also encourages, for as much of your drawing as possible, keep a distance of it. Uh, I haven't thrown my head into the uh, the camera, I don't think yet. And um, some of that is, you know, for the sake of cinematography, and some of that is just fighting the urge to get my nose too far into this picture. Again, lest I sort of fall in love with a nostril at the expense of the whole entirety of it as a picture. All right, so we're going to take a kneaded eraser, and I just want to see how much ink comes up when I blot. That didn't seem too bad. A little bit. Okay, but if I rub, we definitely can tell. So, I'm going to go through with the kneaded eraser first. Pick up what I can of any excess ink that's going to want to bleed when, when hit with water. Again, it's going to dry waterproof, but until that moment, 
all it's going to take is a little puddle around it to send it in all directions. Uh, different pens will have different degrees of this too. Like those felt tip microns tend to dry really fast and stay very, um, very waterproof. Uh, I just, I don't like them as much, which is kind of a shame. All right, so let me do a little test area. And we'll do as much as we can with a number six round student brush and some student cottons. So we'll take some cerulean blue. I'll take a little phthalo green mixed in with it. Dash a little bit into his impressionist sky. All right, and the ink has given us some borders to work within. So inside of those, we can kind of have fun, right? There's parameters to the paint that it's allowed to just be paint inside of. And even, even if you are working in a more detailed, controlled manner, keep a, keep a light touch. Don't try to boss your paint around too much. All right. Part of the charm of the watercolor is the watercolor. It's, it's little accidental things that it's going to want to do. All right, let's take a little burnt sienna and some crimson. Maybe a little bit scarlet just because I've got a kind of dirty palette here. Okay. And I'll go and blob some shapes into his face. some more red to that and we'll get to his ear and we'll put a little bit of that in his his nose as well All right, we'll take some, some of that cloud gray that I was fiddling with and put some of it in his beard. Maybe just a little, give him a little color still kind of hanging out in there. So it's funny, sometimes these, uh, I've said it in another demo already, but sometimes these, these student watercolors just, they don't have the pigment strength of a professional line. If you've never used professional line of watercolors, you won't really know. Um, 
though you may find yourself kind of frustrated going, you know, why am I not picking up more color or why, why is it, does it feel like it's thinning out so quickly? Uh, and you might think it's just you, but if you feel that, my advice is every time one of these little pans gets used up, go ahead and replace the color with a block of either Windsor Newton professional line or some Sennelier, uh, Schmincke. I I've just spent way too much time on that little stupid easel thing. All right, let's give him a yellow raincoat. So it looks like the kneaded eraser and the really did the really did the trick here, actually. Not getting a whole lot of bleed. So I'm kind of gray for his hat. Make sure the shadows of it. And I'm going to pick up some of this muddy violet stuff for any shadows I want to accentuate in his uh, in his raincoat. And I'll make it a little warmer. When yellow reflects on itself, it does tend to get pretty hot. These are things you learn in the course of like still life painting that you just memorize for when you're trying to create an illusion. All right. Let's let this mass a little bit more back here. Right? I'm not being super religious about getting to the edges of the watercolor, but there are going to be areas where it seems more imperative than others that things come together so that these areas where they're less committed uh, don't don't pull the picture apart. We don't want it to, you know, we want it to feel kind of free, but we don't want it to uh, disintegrate as we look at it. Oh, a little bit of snow cap up on the mountains there. You know what? Let's get a little more shadow in the clouds just where I want his hat to break out against it. Who knows? Maybe that's a terrible idea. Yeah, I think now his hat needs a color. All right. So I'm going to wet that and blot it a little bit. You've got, depending on your paper, you've actually got a little bit of time in that regard. Get a little... His nose is a little orange right now. I want it a little rosier, I think. Ooh, but not so much that it bleeds into the mountain. All 
All right, this is the part where I start overworking and overthinking. So let's move on to the ground. All right, have enough paint on your brush that you can move it where you want to go. If you start fighting it, just pick up some more. Uh, be conscious of how much pigment you've got in there for what you're trying to accomplish. All right, your first brush stroke is always going to look pretty loaded with color. And at that point, you'll be tempted to just keep adding more water and spreading it around. And that's going to disperse your color. rocks in the middle ground. I, I think about, I don't know, do they, are they part of the grassy landscape? Are they part of the mountains? Are they somewhere, you know, as they sit in between, what do I want them to be? I should, I should have thought of a little more right here because that's, that got a little ugly. Right. I'm going to tear off a little piece of the paper towel, right, and where it's got this slightly ragged edge. I'm just going to touch that to the painting and let that suck up some of the water and pigment. I'll do that elsewhere too. All right, so now his hat definitely needs a something. So let's just commit to a value and see how I feel about the color identity of it. All right, I feel like the whole thing will feel a little better if I can just get a little more commitment into that sky. And at this point, the trick is knowing when to stop, right? At what point are we done? At what point can we still improve it? And at what point are we going to screw it up? And that's where sometimes it's important to slow down and breathe a little bit. All right, and I think that's, we're pretty close to a safe place to call Camille Pissarro done. As I say that, and I'm still painting. And that must mean we've reached that point where if you're in your studio working, 
you get up close, you back away, you get up close, you back away, you get up close, you back away. So let's go ahead and back away.